Uh, for those of you who thought my audio was a bit loud uh, the last couple of times, I did look at it and fix it, so hopefully I won't be... Um, I forget the term for when you max out audio. It's not feedback, but there is a name for uh, when you max out audio and it, you get automatically cut off. Uh, I don't remember what the name is, but that was happening last time. It may be happening now, but my tests show that it is not happening. So um, we are okay. Okay, so now last time we talked, uh, we showed, uh, we looked at how to tell the sun and moon's declination and right ascension using JavaScript and interpolation. Um, and then an, uh, the problem is we couldn't really use it because we didn't have other information that we needed to make the information we had useful to us. In other words, we couldn't, for example, tell you where the sun was overhead because to do that you need something called the Greenwich Mean GMST, Greenwich Mean Sidereal Time, and we didn't have a formula to, cr uh, to calculate that. Although actually we did have a formula, but it turns out it was um, it used such large numbers that JavaScript uh, got confused, and I don't blame JavaScript. So now today you might think I w I'm actually going to do what I said I was going to do, which is um, write a you know basic astronomy library for JavaScript, uh, so that we can use the uh, right ascension and declination information we've computed. Uh, or you might think that I will do what I often do, which is start on a totally new subject, completely unrelated to the previous stream, um, and you know that 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 just to mess with you. Well, to mess with the people who think either of those things, I'm going to do something that's neither of them. Yeah, that made sense. Um, what I've done here, as you can see on the, uh, and you can see my mouse in the VM, so that's I, that's really great. Um, so what we're doing here is I'm writing a, I'm trying to write a, a basic, not a, not a comprehensive, not a positional, but sort of a basic formulas for astronomy library here in Mathematica. Uh, and the uh, star thing here shows that the whole thing's gonna be a comment, I'm not, you know, all of this is a comment. And uh, what I wanna do then is uh, I wanna use another program I've written, so it's not very good, that will convert the Mathematica library into several other languages, including client-side JavaScript. So the, um, so the, uh, the goal here will be this, if it works, and it won't, we're, we're really doing very basic stuff right now, so it won't work. Um, but if it does, we can convert it to JavaScript, and that sort of solves both of our problems of one, um, creating an astronomy, a basic astronomy library for JavaScript so we can do things with it, and two, uh, me never actually doing what I said I'm going to be doing. Now, a lot of you don't have Mathematica, but you can get a free account. Oh, God, I thought I did a new there. Uh, you can get a free account at wolframcloud.com. This is my free account. Um, I actually do have an other account, it turns out, because I, I, I own Mathematica, but I'm not going to use that one because this is, um, this is the one that uh, you guys can use and you can follow along my work. I don't know if I can actually share this. I probably can. Uh, there's probably a way to share this, but, um, I, I, you know, but, you know, just follow. So, so we're going to do all this, but actually the first thing we're going to do is not actually share this uh, because... This is going to be sort of the documentation. This is in GitHub, and you can't really see the full URL, but it, it's, you know, it's bcastroformulas.m in the Astro subdirectory. So the first thing we're going to do is actually sort of figure out what things we need to do, what things are important to astronomers, or at least to me as an astronomer. Okay, uh, the first thing we're going to do is just mention that um, most objects in the sky have pretty much a fixed right ascension declination, and most people on Earth when they're observing, have a fixed latitude and longitude. So this library is going to assume that if you're changing your right ascension and declination constantly, you're going to have to you know, do some tweaking with the library. It's not going to help you out right away. And if you're in a moving craft, which actually has happened, people do fly in airplanes and move around, again, this library is going to not be exactly what you need. So this library is in, and now this library is in, you know, mostly for people who are in a stationary location, looking at something that has a stationary location on the celestial sphere. One issue with that, of course, is the moon and the sun are not, in fact, uh, stationary on the celestial sphere. They move around. Um, a, the, and I think we talked more about how they moved around yesterday or last time. Uh, but they do move around. And it turns out the sun doesn't actually move that much. It moves slow enough that we can make these assumptions pretty much work. The moon moves too fast for these assumptions to hold. But even then, we can get sort of an approximation and we can... We can tweak the, you know, tweak our not the library, but tweak what what we're what functions we're calling to deal with that. 
So this is more of a, um, a disclaimer that uh, don't assume don't assume this library is going to right away give you you know the uh, sunset sunrise moonrise mood set because those things those things uh, the sun and moon's right ascension and declination do change so now let's move on to I feel like I'm teaching a class oh, I'm back at home um, time oh I'm sorry I forgot we could do that no 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 do not on highlights uh, hang on that was not what I wanted to do. Un undo. I'm going to just reload. Hopefully that'll get rid of it. Okay. It didn't. Wow. Come on, man. Maybe if I copy the link, nope, it won't go away. Reference in. Wow. That's amazing. You can do everything except get rid of it. Those ways. I'm going to do shift reload real quick. And if that doesn't get rid of it, Jesus Christ! Oh, you know what? I think the URL might have actually changed when I did that. There we go. So we'll just get rid of the, uh, the uh, tag after the URL. Unless, of course, I. Wow, I am a moron. Okay, here we go. Okay, sorry about that little delay there. So the first thing I'm going to talk about here without touching any of the lines at the left. What time units are we? do astronomers use? And by the way, I know all this stuff. I mean, you know, to the extent that I know anything. Uh, so this is going to sort of be a lecture on what, what things are important in astronomy. And then at some point, we're going to move on to uh, actually trying to implement them. Or, you know, actually use them in some way. Okay, and these are the times that we get in. These are the times that are important to astronomers. Not necessarily all of them, unfortunately, but but you know, because this is a work in progress. Uh, but but these are the ones that uh, that are important to astronomers in the sense that I have uh, the ones I found so far. The modified Julian date. Now, there's a lot of um, com computation of dates. There's a lot of questions. You know, uh, the original Julian calendar, which I don't mention here. Wow. Okay, hang on. I'm going to make a note to myself somewhere else that uh, uh, JD not that is just hideous that I don't mention that. Um, okay, so the Julian date actually dates back. It pretends that the world started in like 4713 BC or something, and it counts the number of days since then. That's okay. I mean, we don't know if the world actually started then. Probably not. Um, but but the problem is if you're dealing with modern times, your date numbers tend to be really large. I think right now it is, um, in fact, it's right here, that uh, in the year 2000, beginning of 2000, our JD number, our Julian date number, was already up to 2.4 million. So it's sort of not really useful for modern day use, or it's not that useful. So uh, someone, and I don't think it's me, I think someone that's actually done this, has created a modified Julian date, which is the number of days since 2000, you know, January 1st at 12 hours UT. Noon on January 1st at 12 hours UT, which is also 2000.0. That's called J2000.0. Um, I don't really want to edit it here, so I'm not going to, I've got it also in a file, but I'm going to leave it just the way it is right now, unless I notice something terrible, and then I'll make a note to fix it. And uh, that's equivalent to uh, the true JD of 245. Uh, ju uh, Julian date changes at noon. So this point zero is correct. And z Unix time, it's just this. Okay? Um, and I guess what I'm also going to be doing here is defining what units I'm going to be using. So the modified Julian date, somewhat important. The Greenwich mean sidereal times, uh, time means that if you were in Greenwich, um, what right ascension of stars would be overhead, what right ascension of star would be overhead. That's the mean sidereal time. Uh, we say mean sidereal time because uh, actually I don't really know, but there's a very slight difference between that and actual sidereal time. But what we want is Greenwich mean sidereal time. And of course, if we know the uh, sidereal time at Greenwich, we can use our latitude and longitude, you know, we can use longitude, you don't even need latitude, to compute the sidereal time uh, anywhere in the world. So give me one second here while I get rid of these pop-ups that you can't see. Okay. Um, and that's really useful because that tells us, uh, you know, uh, if, if the sun has a sidereal right ascension of five hours, that means wherever the sidereal time is five hours, the sun is at its highest point for the day. Okay. Um, now, the one interesting thing I'm doing with all of these is because I just hate 
constants. Um, not constants, but constants. Although constant, uh, constants isn't that great either. I'm going to measure everything in radians, including b the sort of thing people normally don't measure in radians, like sidereal time. So just to be clear, a sidereal day, that's the amount of time it takes for, like, let's say if Sirius is culminating at the southern horizon and you wait till it does that again, that's a sidereal day. It turns out that's 23 hours and 56 minutes, four minutes shorter than the, uh, the, the solar day because the sun actually moves backwards across, moves against the direction of the Earth's spin. It, uh, it, it retrogrades, uh, not in the ast astronomical sense, but compared to the Earth's rotation. So I'm going to measure Greenwich Mean's sidereal time in radians, which means I'm going to say 23 hours, 56 minutes, that's our sidereal day, I'm going to refer to it as 2 pi. It turns out that's really, really useful uh, because you don't have to wor worry about converting to degrees, you don't have to worry about converting to, to um, hours, anything like that, so we're going to do that. Um, so time is going to just be the sidereal time. So whenever I need to refer to the sidereal time, not necessarily at Greenwich, it's going to be time, it's going to be in radians, and as I said earlier, the 2 pi is going to be approximately 23 hours, 56 minutes of clock time. Uh, day of the year, okay? And that is going to be, of course, different for each year. It's the number of whole days since January 1 at 0 hours UT. So at the beginning of January 2, in other words, the midnight that ends January 1st and begins January 2nd, the number of days is going to be 1. January 1st at noon, it's going to be 0 0.5. Now, uh, most days, most years, of course, have 365 days, but leap years have 366, so this number could go as high as 366 in leap years. Okay, then there's the Unix time, which is actually fairly standard. It's the number of seconds since, uh, you know, the epoch, which Unix considers to be January 1st, 1970, 0 hours UT, uh, UTC. Okay, ephemeris time is the uh, is the number of seconds since uh, it's the same as this all um, uh, well, okay mjd is the number of days uh, ephemeris time is the number of seconds but there's an issue here and i guess i've i've covered it here um, the number the number of seconds between today and tomorrow is normally 86400 seconds uh, a unix assu uh, the unix time assumes that pretty much every time that i have except for ephemeris time will assume that however because the Earth's, because the sun's, you know, the average time between noon today and noon tomorrow is actually a fraction of a second over 86,400, every so often we have to add a leap second. When we do that, a day becomes 86,401 seconds long. Ephemeris time actually clicks ahead during the leap second. Most clocks ignore it. Um, so as far as Unix is concerned, tomorrow is always 86,400 seconds away from today. Ephemeris time, though, will sometimes say that it is 86,401 seconds to tomorrow. Um, however, I'm making this delineation. I'm not going to include leap seconds right now. That might be a to-do thing, uh, because computing le leap seconds are sort of inserted, not randomly, obviously, but in, in a very sort of hard-to-predict way, because the Earth's high-precision Earth rotation is only known for a little while out. But we're just gonna we're just gonna live with that. So we're just that's just another way to say, basically MJD over 86400 whatever. But these these are some of the times we're gonna be using. The angular units we're gonna be using radians and degrees we're all familiar with. Uh, now right ascension is mentioned is measured in hours, and this does have some meaning because we also measure time in hours. Um, so hours is a unit of of measurement. It's equal to 15 degrees pi over 12 radians, as you might guess, 24 hours, full cycle, 360 degrees. That's, that's what it's based on. Um, so that's just another unit we're going to use. Uh, now, an ellipse has all sorts of properties, so this is very incomplete. Um, and I don't even know if I do anything with ellipses down in this, uh, in this uh, library. But uh, we, two of the things we can measure are the uh, length of the semi-major axis and the length of the semi minor That's the longest axis. Semi-minor axis is the shortest axis. Uh, and the eccentricity, which is actually of, you know, can be computed from S major and S minor. So that, those are some minimal properties of an ellipse. Um, now, orbit properties, we can assume to a close approximation that planets follow elliptical orbits around the sun. 
Uh, and these elliptical orbits have some, have some um, properties that are very useful. First of all, inclination of the ecliptic plane, or in inclination of the ecliptic. Um, Earth has pretty much a zero inclination because we, it's the Earth that defines the ecliptic. Other planets are, don't, uh, don't revolve in the same plane as the Earth. They're a little bit tilted. Uh, and some of them are very tilted, but it turns out most of the planets are not that tilted from, from, the, uh, from the eclipse, from our Earth's ecliptic. That's called the inclination of the uh, inclination to the ecliptic. It is important when you're trying to find a planet's position. And I, to be honest, I have no freaking idea whether uh, or not I do anything with it, but that's, that's an important property of an orbit. Periapsis, which you could call perihelion or perigee for different things, um, that's when the orbit, uh, that's when the planet or the object we're looking at is closest to whatever it's uh, revolving around. So when the Earth is closest to the sun, it's our periapsis with the sun. Because the sun is helios or helion, we call that our perihelion. When the moon, which revolves around the Earth, it actually also revolves around the sun, but that's less interesting. Uh, when it gets closest to us, we call it perigee, the G being short for Gaia or Earth. Uh, and uh, the Jovian moons, the four moons of Jupiter, when they get closest to Jupiter, it's called a perijove. But the generic term is periapsis. Uh, and that works for any uh, elliptical orbit. And the sort of opposite of it is apoapsis, the maximum distance. Now, the argument of the periapsis, do I actually have, I think, maybe I did this because I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Whoa, no, 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 no. That's not what I meant to do. Oh. Sometimes if it wrecked, there we go. So... All this crap is coming from this diagram, pretty much, and these are pretty much standard parameters. So if you want to learn some astronomy, this is this is it. Um, wow, is this? Oh no, it's actually supposed to be cut off. Okay, the argument of the periapsis, the because because we have a tilted orbit here, uh, we kind of need to know where is it tilted? Where does it um, where does it you know where does it touch the plane of the ecliptic? And that is the longitude of the ascending node. Big fancy. Oh wow. And I can highlight an SVG. Uh, and by the way, and this uh, this link is in my GitHub. It's in that file, so you can find it. And that's called, you know, we start from the reference direction, and this means the first point of Aries, not in Aries anymore, but you know, the zero hour. And then we, the first thing we do is, we, you know, we say, well, where exactly does this thing sort of jump in and out of the Earth, jump in and out of the ecliptic plane? And that is called the longitude of the ascending node. Then the question is, how far? What the, what's the degree measurement? You know, how tilted is it? That's the inclination. Now, once we've measured the longitude of the um, ascending node, we want to know when is the planet closest to whatever it's revolving around. That's called the argument of the periapsis. Um, and then, at any given time, of course, the planet probably won't be at its periapsis. The angular distance between the argument of the periapsis and where the planet actually is is called the true anomaly. And I think I'm missing one thing here. Uh, the ascending node is where basically the, the planet touches the ecliptic. So it goes up, arguing the peri periapsis, true anomaly, hopefully I've got all of that stuff there. You can refer back to it. Um, a lo and the longitude of the ascending node, so we, that's the first thing we actually usually calculate, which tells us where the planet touches the plane of the ecliptic. The mean anomaly and the true anomaly. I don't think this shows mean anomaly because that is kind of a hard thing to show. So we know the true anomaly tells us where the planet is. So what's the mean anomaly? Well, if we assume that planets ro revolved in perfect circular orbits and that the, you know, and that um, the true anomaly, if they're, you know, they're the anomaly increased uh, by a very steady amount, like one degree per day for Earth would be pretty close, uh, that would be, that would be the mean anomaly. That would be um, uh, you know, sort of a theoretical planet that uh, revolves in a circle that kind of matches the ellipse. Uh, of course, that doesn't work for real ellipses because by Kepler's law, planets sweep out equal areas in equal times, uh, which basically means um, th the closer a planet is, the faster it's revolving, the further away it is, the slower it's revolving. I think that's correct. Um, so the new anomaly is basically just sort of a... Um, if the planet were behaving nicely and going in a circle, that's what we'd compute. That's not what we're interested in, but it's very easy to calculate, and we can use it to get the true anomaly, uh, which is what we actually are looking for. Okay. Now, I haven't really looked at this file for a while. 
So why are we writing this library? Um, no reason. But a possible reason is there's a lot of questions in Astronomy Stack Exchange uh, that can be answered by writing a generic, uh, generic astronomy library that it doesn't even really need a lot of information because it turns out a lot of things like the extreme positions of the sun are known. I mean, the sun's maximum declination is 23.5 degrees, or it's actually, you know, the, the obliquity of the ecliptic, but, you know, roughly 23.5 degrees. So even without having positional data, which this library does not have, it doesn't tell you where the sun and moon are, we can answer a, a lot of, of questions about, um, about the, you know, a lot of questions from astronomy. Okay, now we're going to talk about celestial position, and just to be clear now, um, celestial position does not include uh, distance. So, uh, you know, you could, if you wanted to tell someone where the moon is, you might say, well, look southeast, look 50 degrees up. But you don't need to tell them how far the moon is. If you look southeast 50 degrees up, the moon is there, the distance doesn't matter. So we, we, we have a fiction called the uh, celestial sphere where we assume we're looking at the stars and we're pretending, for just for right now, they're all at the same distance, which we define to be one because that's a nice number. So we don't have anything dealing with distance here. So we measure celestial position with right ascensions, and I'm going to use radians for everything. Right ascension is kind of like longitude, so um, kind of on the celestial sphere like longitude. Not exactly, though. Uh, declination, uh, which is like latitude, also in radians. The hour angle, which uh, <laughs> I had to explain to myself. Um, the hour angle is the sidereal hour since culmination. So if... Um, if the object culminated at five hours sidereal time, had a right ascension of five hours, it would culminate at five hours local sidereal time. And local sidereal time we could compute from Greenwich Mean Standard Time. Um, but what about, you know, that's just one instant of time. Well, one hour later, the object is still at, you know, its right ascension is still five hours, but now it's six hours. Um, let's see, do I mean that? Yes. It's now six hours sidereal time, which is almost an hour later, but not quite, because 24 sidereal hours are 23 hours, 56 minutes. Um, so this, this measures how far away it is from culmination. So it, it, when it culminates, it's zero. When it's anti-culminating, this is going to be 12 hours. But since we're measuring in radians, it's going to be pi radians. OK. Now we get back to sort of Earth familiar quest, uh, uh, variables. Um, so if you're, if you're on Earth and you want to describe where something in the sky is, uh, you would use azimuth. So zero is, okay, wow, in, in radians. So if something is due north, you would say zero degrees. East would be 90 degrees. Northeast would be like 45 degrees. South is 180 degrees, and so on and so forth. Uh, but of course, I'm doing everything in radians, so really zero is north, pi over two is east, and so on. So once you know sort of like what direction to look at, the question is how high in the sky do you want to look? And that is the alt or altitude in radians, which as I point out uh, really terribly, uh, altitude and elevation are two terms used both by astronomers and geologists or geographers or whoever those people are to describe uh, both how high in the sky something is and how high above sea level something is. So I've decided I'm going to use alt to mean altitude in radians, which tells you high, how high an object is in the sky. So once you face the correct direction, how far up do you need to look? So now we can go to something pretty simple here. The um, geographic position, where on the Earth are you? And that's latitude, usually measured in degrees. I'm going for radians. Longitude, usually measured in uh, degrees also, going for radians. Um, I don't know, actually know, the, the red is going to tell you how far from the center of the Earth you are. And it turns out you might think that's, that's pretty constant, and it is pretty constant, but it turns out the Earth's equatorial radius is larger than the Earth's polar radius. You're further from the Earth when you're on the equator than when you're at either of the poles. In addition to that, there is some elevation issues. For example, on Mount Kilimanjaro, you're, of course, five miles above the ground, so you're even further from the Earth's center. Uh, and, you know, there are a few valleys, I guess, like Death Valley, where you are slightly lower than you would be otherwise. Uh, and elevation, oh, I'm sorry, that's, sorry, 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 ignore that. The radi radius just accounts for your latitude. Then in addition to radius, there is an elevation. Uh, how, how many, uh, how many, uh, and I'm measuring in, oh, I guess I'm measuring the radius in kilometers and the elevation in kilometers, because there's no way to measure that in radians. Um, let's pretend. 
Yeah, so in kilometers. So basically this tells you, based on your latitude, how far are you from the center of the Earth, and the elevation tells you, even at that latitude, if you're on a, a above sea level or below sea level, that will affect that. Okay. Oh my god. I don't even know how much of this stuff I'm doing. But we're getting close to the actual formulas, um, which I can cut and paste into Mathematica, you know, the Wolfram cloud thing. I don't know if that's going to be helpful at all to anyone anywhere, but okay, that's generally true. Okay, um, we assume for this program, uh, for the, this library, and we might need to change it, that the inclination of the ecliptic to the equator is fixed. It's very nearly 23.5 degrees, and it is very nearly fixed, but it actually varies over time. Uh, it, the, the, it varies very slightly uh, as the Earth uh, as the Earth mutates and precesses. Um, but I think we're going to treat it as a constant. At least I think that's what it means. So what, what are some interesting things we might want to know about celestial objects? Well, well we want to know when they rise. That's pretty important. When they set, culmination, which is another way of saying the, the highest altitude, they're highest in the sky, uh, they will usually either be, uh, they will always either be dead south or dead north, depending on what hemisphere you're on. Up, well, that's a binary flag. We're asking, is the object above the horizon or below the horizon? Of course, if we knew the rise and set times, we could get to that. But this, this also tells us, you know, is it currently up at a given time? Is it up or not up? Uh, and th there is no down, but of course, negative of up would be down, uh, with the small exception of things that actually have angular uh, radius like the sun and moon, but we'll talk about that later. Um, okay, and then we might want to know if the objects, like, you know, if, if an object is, a, if a, a faint star is like at one degree altitude, you probably won't be able to see it because of uh, ground haze um, or atmospheric extin extinction, which is a fancy way of saying uh, things that are low to the ground have to travel through more atmosphere before they get to you, and the atmosphere, uh, you know, dims them and actually also turbulence makes it hard to see. So you might want to ask the question, um, when is this, uh, is the object currently above 15 degrees of altitude so I can see it, or below it? Um, I don't know why I have two of these and not an up and a down, but anyway, so, you know, is it below, is it above? Uh, distance is the angular distance um, of something, uh, obviously of two different things. Disk length is the length distance. Um, boy, oh boy. I don't know what the hell I meant here. But uh, let's pretend like I did. So we're just going to kind of skip that. Um, and the length distance is the actual physical distance between two objects. These are all sort of things we might want to know about one or more objects, um, I think. Okay, now we have some of the really... Um, oh, wow. I didn't know I'd actually... I do have some, uh, apparently, I do have some, uh, some approximate functions here. So ETD Unix is very basic because they're just separated by a constant. They both measure number of seconds. One just measures seconds starting at a later time than the other. I apparently do have approximate solar RA and uh, declination here. I apparently computed this a long time ago uh, to an accuracy of one minute, which isn't bad. It's not as good as the interpolation we looked at yesterday, which has an accuracy of two arc seconds, which is uh, 30 times better. So let me go ahead and start copying some of this. Well, let's take a look here. Um, so Unix time, G and again, this is, these are all very simple computations. If you know the Unix time and you want the modified Julian date, well, you have to subtract the number of seconds, you know, you subtract from 2000 and divide by the number of seconds in a day. Uh, JD to MG day, you know, again, these are very simple functions. This is not a really simple function. And this is actually a problematic function that we need to, we need to look at uh, because it's not going to work in JavaScript the way, the way I've written it right now. Okay. So somehow we have to get to the Greenwich Mean Sidereal Time. I guess I decided, probably because I used the site that, that gives this number, uh, to use the modified Julian date, which number can be fractional. So Julian date zero is the year 2000, uh, January 1st at noon. Point 0.1 would be 2.5 hours, 2.4 hours after that, because point 0.1 is a tenth of a day, and a tenth of a day is 2.4 hours. Okay, so from here, we can actually get the, uh, this formula, I, I, I mean, I, I almost want to find it just because it's important, but apparently I am, that's actually not it. 
that's a different one that, that works, but it's not what I'm looking for. Um, but anyway, this is actually from an official source somewhere. And let me give you a little Google tip here just to annoy you. Um, wow. Hang on one second if I can find what I was doing. Yeah. If you search for this number in Google, you might actually be able to, yeah. Um, you might actually hit the, um, hit the actual page it's on. Um, and if you want to just find it on the government sites, we can do site.gov. Um, and it, it used to be in a much better place than this. This is not where we, it's going to be. But, but it does, it, they do happen to have this ideal time formula here also for some reason. Um, yeah, so they do, they do have it here. But this is, this is a correct formula. Um, okay, now the correct formula is actually given in hours, which is, uh, let me get this here, this part here. Um, let's, you know, so basically at zero hour, at noon Greenwich time, um, on January 1st, 2000. The, the Greenwich Mean Sidereal Time was 18.69, blah, 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 blah. Every day it increases by more than 24 hours because the sidereal day is 23 hours, 56 minutes, roughly, and so it's more than 24 hours sidereal time in a sidereal day. So what's wrong with this function? Well, lots of things. It has issues. Now let me see if I can actually do what I wanted to do, which is... Um, cut and paste this into the Mathematica-like thing to see what goes horribly wrong here if you're not using Mathematica. I mean, if you're using Mathematica, it turns out uh, nothing goes horribly wrong. And I realize I did get a little bit too much stuff in there. I don't even know if this is going to work, by the way. Uh, apparently not. Come on. Oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Just taking a while because I cut and pasted so much crap. That's actually not bad. Except I kind of accidentally commented out some crap. Okay. It's being a little bit finicky here, but, you know, I did terrible things to it, so... It's okay for right... It's acceptable for right now. Okay, here we go. Blah, 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 blah. Approximate blah, 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 blah. Scroll the screen. So, approximate, approximate. Uh, and... somehow I decided to take this the way I wanted it, which was as a separate thing. Okay, so of course we haven't evaluated anything. This is all just, I think if I do shift enter, no, actually maybe I have. Uh, and that doesn't actually, um, okay, so now let's, let's see what's wrong with this formula. Let's just, and let's be very, very abstract here and just say mg day of just variable time t, or I could even said d if I wanted to. That's not cool. Okay, bad, badness. Evaluate the cell, damn it. Oh, I guess it took all of this as not as input one. Okay, hang on. We're gonna fix. Oh, because maybe because I had it commented out originally. So I'm gonna have to cut this, I guess, into uh, input one here. Sorry, this is just ugliness. I'm doing a paste here. It's going to take a few seconds. Hopefully by... Input 1 is, of course, the first input Mathematica accepts. So I think the fact that I put it like way up there didn't actually work. So now, if I've done this correctly... And I can erase this because I don't... Right, where well this is going too far. Uh, MGD to test. And now we can... I think if we shift enter it, it will all get evaluated. So now if I evaluate this, we're going to see the problem. No, we won't. That is just fascinating. Um, that is like insanely fascinating actually. Um, the problem was, and maybe if I add a comma zero here, I'm, I'll, we'll see it. Um, and someone actually complained about this on, on Stack Exchange. I won't tell you where, but you could probably find it. This is the problem. We're using, um, really, these numbers aren't as large as I thought they were. OK, 
apparently this doesn't quite work the same way as Mathematica does. The problem basically is when you rationalize numbers like this so that they, uh, they are, you know, they are fractions, the numbers get so big, so ugly, and I think we actually looked at this the, the last time um, in Replit. The numbers get so big and ugly that, uh, you know, most, uh, most uh, programming languages won't handle them unless you have like a big number or something. Uh, but we saw that in JavaScript last time. And what's interesting here is it's actually not doing what I need it to do in breaking. But the way to get around that, even here we have 1 12th pi, but we can actually just do this. And that should give us a numerical approximation. And there you go, that's a pretty nice formula for, where t is, by the way, the number of days. So I'm going to make it d for days. Um, unfortunately, this <laughs> formula has the other problem, which is you see this many digits, but there's more digits to it than this. And r I'll explain that in just a sec here. So let's see, this is... Um, now you'll also notice the other weird thing is that this, uh, you could multiply 0.2617, you can multiply it across here. But it won't do it by, by, um, by default. But I can force the issue. So this is kind of, you know, why Mathematica can be messy. There we go, it's beautiful, isn't it? And it's also not high precision enough. But it turns out Mathematica stores higher precision. Um, oh, you know what? I could have done a... Um, yeah. Y but you know what? That's actually incorrect. I should do... Uh, by default, n only gives some... I think we could do just... Uh, let's just give me 20 digits of it. So now it'll give me 20 digit precision, which is, again, going the other... No, no, no. I know what's wrong. The n... So we want to expand it first. And then we want to take n to 20 digits. And again, this does not behave exactly the way Mathematica does, which, which confuses me. There we go. So that's, again, 20 digits is too many significant digits now. But that's the kind of formula uh, we would be putting into... Um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to think it and talk at the same time. doesn't work. Uh, the kind of formula we could put into uh, into JavaScript. Uh, it turns out, and that actually will be very close to the formula we will use in JavaScript to give the um, to give the current Greenwich Mean Standard Time. Not not difficult. Okay, so do we have anything more? That was the sort of the first interesting function we had. Now, this function here is actually broken up into two functions below it. But this is, uh, this is actually a really important uh, function in astronomy, in observational astronomy. And in fact, it might be the, like, the only uh, important function in astronomy, because I think you can get to in observational astronomy. Because you can get, you can get to a lot of other formulas just from this, um, including its reverse and, and other stuff we're going to look at. So what does this do? So let's say you want to know where you're going to find a given star. And you know where you are. You know your latitude and longitude. You know the right ascension and declination of the star. And you even know the Greenwich Mean Standard Time, sidereal time. Greenwich Mean Sidereal Time. Um, so if you know all that, can you tell where in the sky to look for a star? And the answer is yes. The formula is, I'm going to go down here, actually, because I like this one better. It's, it's the same formula, but it's broken up a little bit. And the formula is here is actually, oh, shit. No, sorry, this formula just copies this one. And, and it's a pretty complicated formula. I mean, you have to take R tan, multiply cosines, declination, blah, 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 blah. But it's not really that hard. I mean, it's, it's a complicated formula, but once you have it, you have it. And this could be said to be the fundamental formula of observational astronomy. So memorize it for tomorrow. Just kidding. Um, okay. And a lot of these, and these two functions just take the, this function here returns two values, which isn't horribly ugly because usually you need both the azimuth and the altitude at the same time, but is ugly because if you're going to convert stuff to other programming languages, you want to keep things as simple as possible, and I'm not sure I feel comfortable returning arrays. Um, so really you want these two separate functions, and it turns out that you know calculating them separately isn't, isn't a bad thing. Um, so if we put this all in, if we just randomly click, if we put this all into our little Mathematica thing, um, as input, how do we get to input 25? I mean, just really? Hey, 
there we go. I think I need to do an eval on this cell. So shift enter. And magic has maybe happened. Okay, so how can we test this function? Should we test this function? Um, well, apparently, come on. I want to go to the next cell. Okay, I guess this has started its own cell. Um, so you know what, let's do it for something. Um, I'm gonna do it for something I have, well actually I don't know if I have all these numbers. Um, so let's pretend we don't do that. So, and again, the azimuth and altitude re return from these functions is in radians. So, good function here. Let's go over some of the others that we might want to cut and paste over. Um, now, of course, this function here, if you're a mathematician, or even if you're not, I mean, it doesn't change the facts, uh, this function shows actually a relationship between rate ascension, declination, latitude, longitude, GMST, azimuth, and altitude. So that's it's got seven variables there. And if you have five of them, you can get azimuth and altitude. But it turns out if you have a different five of them, you might be able to get other stuff out of it. Not exactly, because it turns out there's some interdependencies that are not purely independent of each other. But ba basically... If you have any five of these numbers, right, ascension, declination, altitude, altitude, uh, latitude, longitude, you can get the other two. Sometimes that's actually useful. Um, so if you know the um, right ascension of uh, something and the declination, and your latitude and longitude, and you know how high it is in the sky, you can compute the Greenwich Mean Standard Time. If you know the uh, declination, <laughs> oh wow. Um, this is cool. Um, I don't know why we're discussing this. I, I mean, just to discuss it, I guess. Um, to show some of the stuff we might be interested in in astronomy and to kill time. Okay, so here, if you know, uh, and this is actually somewhat, somewhat special. If you know um, the declination of an object and the latitude you're in, um, and you, get, you give an altitude, this will tell you how long a given object is above a given altitude. It's a pretty simple formula because the altitude of something, uh, or the amount of time something spends at a given altitude or above a given altitude, is only based on uh, your latitude and the declination of the object. It is not based on the right ascension. The right ascension will tell you when the object is up and down, but it won't tell you how long. The amount of time it stays up, again, in sidereal radians, which is a very strange unit, is this. Uh, then you might want to know if you have the, um, yeah, again, if you know the declination, your latitude, and the altitude, you might want to know what the azimuth is. You might think that that's not a fixed number, but it turns out the, the formula is actually, and it's not, by the way, just to point out really quickly, um, this, these, are two an these are two answers here. So if you know your declination, uh, you know, declination of your object, your latitude, and you know how high it is in the sky, you can calculate the azimuth, but it's either, it's going to be one of two numbers, depending on if the object has culminated yet, in other words, if the object is increasing in altitude, or it's already culminated and it's setting and it's decreasing in, in altitude. Now notice that, uh, you know, we can actually here, time above alt, if we put in a zero for this, this formula turns out to simplify, and that tells us basically how long an object is above the horizon. And from that, we can actually compute, you know, we're going to actually compute uh, when it rises and sets. That's very easy. It's also problematic because it doesn't include refraction or angular, di uh, angular radius. But it turns out that is actually a fairly, uh, this formula f simplifies quite nicely when alt is zero. And that is helpful for making simpler calculations. And here, what the hell does this give me? Oh, right. This is actually the same function as the one. This is this function and this function are the same. Here it sort of corrects by, because the two values of azimuth you're going to get are plus and minus of each other. So this basically just tells you the absolute value, and you can figure out, you know, it's plus and minus that. Sometimes useful. We, we treat. Oh, actually, I've got two nice functions here. The fixed ecliptic, I'm going to pretend, we're going to pretend for most calculations, the ecliptic is fixed at 23.4393. Three. 
Multiplying by degrees will convert this number to radians. I don't know what that number actually is, but whatever. Uh, but we also have a nice little formula here that co compensates for the Earth's uh, nutation and precession, which says uh, that, which allows the, the ecliptic uh, obliquity to change over time. This does not work. Okay, so we'll just skip it. Uh, by the way, a lot of this stuff here is because Mathematica assumes your numbers are complex uh, numbers or just, it assumes, it makes no real assumptions about your numbers. But you can force it to make assumptions like these are all real numbers and these are all numbers that are going to be like, you know, between negative pi and pi or between zero and pi over two. Okay. Now I'm getting the feeling we shouldn't have gone through some of this stuff. Um, Mathematica is, God, this is really useless. Mathematica is sometimes bad about, in fact, this formula doesn't actually always hold. The, the two-form arctangent cannot always be converted to a one-form arctangent because the two-form arctangent, the two-argument arctangent knows what quadrant you're in. However, to simplify formulas, sometimes it's useful to pretend like arctan arc xy is arctan y over x. Uh, these are some conditions, these are some relations. Um, and Right, and here are the equa some equations um, that I think we converted. The hour angle, by the way, which I don't have a function for, is just the local sidereal time minus the right ascension, because the right ascension is when something accumulates. So I think the rest of this file, okay, and by the way, uh, over here, a lot of this file is redundant, I just realized. Um, I think a lot of the rest of this file above is not nice. Okay. A lot of the rest of this file basically tells you how I got the results above this. So, um, I've actually lost all concept of what we're trying to do, um, but actually I haven't. Right, and, and the idea here is we can convert this library in some way to multiple languages, including client-side JavaScript. Uh, however, it's not a trivial transformation. So now I've got to go look over here. Ooh, shiny, I still have Stellarium going. It's not bad, actually, that I can have all this stuff going without much of a load on the system. Um, somewhere I do have Emacs, there we are. Um, and by the way, this was the problem here, is these are the numbers we end up using if we do this, uh, we do this sort of exact, uh, you know, we do this rationalization. It's really ugly. Um, but, but, but and these are, by the way, uh, oh god. You see the, oh, this is actually another library, ha! Huh? Uh, this is a li more general library, uh, where I, I guess I need, I thought I needed GMST in there. Okay, um, so the question is, and I don't know the answer, is uh, can we convert the formulas we need for astronomical stuff to JavaScript and then just sort of dump them in? And we tried that earlier for the uh, for the map code, and it didn't work uh, because it didn't work. Let's hope the uh, do I have a console up? I should. Maybe I don't. I'm gonna go ahead and minimize Stellarium. Maybe I got rid of my no. There it is. It's my console. Okay, because I've been using Emacs for our shell, which isn't a bad idea. So now I'm gonna try to see if we can. Um, Oh, this is this is going to be fun. Uh, it's called Rosetta, and I have oh wow, I have a a BC functions astro.xml. That's actually kind of cool. Um, I, I'm very hesitant. I can actually just load it because this is Emacs. Very hesitant to show you this. using vacuous schema. That's a new one on me. So these are basically the function names and uh, they're described in Mathematica's uh, tree form, right? This might be, it's not full form. A form that basically just sort of breaks them down into its consti constituent parts. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, Polish notation, which is the reverse of reverse Polish notation. Uh, it's, uh, it's prefix format. Um, and that, it turns out, is the not the easiest way to convert it to other things. Hey, <laughs> but guess what? That's the way I'm going to do it. So it does look like we have these. Um, um, oh, and by the way, some of these functions don't work really well. So active zero here in the XML means 
uh, the, the code that you converts this into multiple languages will not run for this function. And I think there's a reason it doesn't work for this function. And so uh, I will have an entire section for tests. Yeah, right now we only have one test per function just to make sure that things didn't go horribly wrong. So I think most of these are active. Yeah, one, one. So now, how are we going to convert this to multiple languages? That yeah, beats the hell out of me. All right, let's do that. Uh, and somewhere in here, I have a Perl, the BC Lang convert. You'll notice, of course, the Perl script, uh, the Perl uh, name has, you know, really confusing. Um, Astro testing. Oh, let's see what horrible things I've done to BC Lang convert. Actually, this might have done it. It's pretty quick. Um, so if it's actually worked, it writes to temp blc dot the current the language's extension, uh, which I seriously doubt this has worked, but let's find out. And, uh, well, it is December 3rd at 2141 if you are in the Greenwich time zone. Um, Now, one point I actually used to write a shell file that would run basically all of this stuff. I don't know if I still do that. Let me see if I... I might still do that. Uh, push run, curlang run. But do I ever print out the whole... Oh! I printed it out as a debugging statement, so... What the hell? Let's do it. Yeah, that's reason not to do it. But actually, here's what we need to do. So this stuff, um, I'm, I could do these all at once. Uh, so I've converted it, not really, but hopefully, to R, JavaScript, client side, Lua, Mathix, which is a Python program uh, that has, I think, been abandoned, unfortunately, Perl, uh, PHP, Python, and Ruby. And if you're saying, that's impossible, Batman, I'm not Batman. Um, Let's go ahead and see if these uh, these tests work, and uh, they'll tell us what you know. But I keep forgetting I'm in Emacs, so I can just really do this. And could not find function arc cosine. That's broken. And the one we really care about, of course, is the JavaScript one. And I think the problem here is arc cosine is like a cosine or something. Math arc cosine is not a function. <laughs> so I really should be changing arc cosine to a cos, which is what I think it's called in other languages. So I'm not going to be crazy enough to convert to to tweak code on this copy of the git, which will no longer be a copy, of course, uh, while I'm running it. Well, only a fool would do that, you say. So yes. Um, let's see. Uh, Th this is just hideously ugly. It basically converts stuff from Mathematica format to something else format. Um, and it's not exactly the same for... Oh. Oh, 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 oh. So I'm basically going to copy... Um, well, Arctan has two arguments. Uh, so Perl... So basically I'm going to define the, uh, the arc cosine. I'm hoping this is going to do what I want. Probably won't. I mean... Um, I don't, I don't know why I thought this was working at one point, but anyway. M now, um, I'm pretty sure uh, we can check with the uh, astro language. Functions astro. Um, how it writes, I think it writes R cosine like this. Well, it does write R cosine. Um, now, what's interesting here, we're not going to do it, but you could, in fact, compute the arc cosine from the arc tangent, uh, because if you know the arc tangent, you can draw a reference triangle and compute the arc cosine. But there's really no need to do that. Oh, fuck, 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 fuck. So I've defined the secant as 1 over. I've defined... Um, so this is actually really simple. We're just going to change arc cosine to a cos. All the other crap you see, by the way. I want to make sure I'm not... There, parentheses, there... And all this, th this is just a freaking weird piece of crap, okay? Just, just deal with it. I'm pretty sure I've messed something up here, but let's see if this runs. Um, 
And just, you know, briefly the problem is, of course, most languages don't have secant, but secant is one of our cosine, so we can handle that. Uh, different languages, um, the, the primary difference between a lot of these languages is whether they put, they use a math object or they have a built-in function called, like, absolute value. Um, in some cases, when Mathematicus is absolute value, it means floating point absolute value. So we have to do that little conversion. So this is really some trivial crap. Uh, it shows more that languages are very similar to each other than different. And in fact, since I don't give a damn about you people, this is actually, these are actually descriptions of languages and how they differ in terms of, of taking arguments and stuff. Uh, this is the, you know, the file extension. Uh, how you define a function, well, let's see. How you define a function given a bunch of variables. So in Mathix, you do it, right, you put the function name followed by a bracket, followed by variables, followed by the body. Uh, how do you print something out? Well, print. Uh, the comment begins with star this, you know, parenthesis star, ends with star this, uh, and a multi-line comment begins with star that and ends with star that. And I know this is not proper XML. Um, Perl, let's actually go down to something like JavaScript real quick. Um, oh and this also tells you if you want to run something, it's Ruby space, whatever, you know, the file name is. Uh, Python, uh, JavaScript, here we go. JS is the extension. Uh, for JavaScript, you write the, the function name, parentheses, variables, return, whatever the body's going to be, not very hard. The print is the print. Um, this is a special thing for uh, looking at whether or not um, the, the test value is correct. Comments, single line comments begin with slash slash, multi line comments begin with uh, slash start and end with star slash. And to run it, you just do JS file. And um, on this line here, the math math line says JavaScript uses a math object. Uh, other languages do not. Some some do, some don't. Uh, and some of them, <laughs> this is this is why they're so mildly ugly. Python, for example, uses a math object, but it's lowercase math. Uh, and for uh, JavaScript, it's a camel case math. Just brilliant. Um, so it, it's like they're almost consistent with each other, but they don't quite want to be consistent. So now let's see if my fix, uh, let's go back to the shell and see if my fix probably didn't fix things. I mean, that would be very strange. Um, it probably actually broke the code. Well, didn't break the code. And so let's go ahead and see if it works in R now. Uh, deck to time. Mm. Mm hmm. That since that didn't work, I'm actually kind of skeptical this is going to work uh, at all. I think this worked at one time, but you know, not anymore. Wow. Okay. Um, it's sort of disappointing that. Uh, why am I running four tests here? That's weird. The two tests that actually did go through, I mean, that rounded off, but it does look like they actually worked. Um, which is surprising. And partly it's surprising because there's only supposed to be one test. Why don't we go ahead and bring up temp, uh, if I don't already have it. Look at it real quick. So again, this is very hideously written because all of these functions are derived uh, from from Mathematica and converted. Uh, vector angle. So, oh, I'm sorry. Each function gets its, um, gets its, uh, its own little test. Um, and for some bizarre reason, I've decided that um, I've probably not put in the correct arguments into my BC uh, function, astro function, functions astro. So usually I would put that into um, arg test and answer, but I guess I've been lazy and not done that for some of these. I'm tempted to do it now. Um, and it might be because uh, I want to use sort of something I can verify with Mathematica, which, which gets harder than, than this just doing it. The fact that it runs at all is like sort of amazing. Uh, the fact that it runs for JavaScript is pretty darn amazing. And now I'm just curious because I want to see if it's going to run in Lua. 
if it does. This, you know, when it works, it works actually pretty well. Uh, bad argument in one to cosine. Ex yeah, I think uh, that I've I've really messed this up somehow. Perl, I know it's going to work because I er, I love Perl and everything has to work in Perl. If it doesn't, I'll be embarrassed. Oh wow! Yes, Perl doesn't like it doesn't even have an acos. Um, brilliant. I wonder if it has an arccos. Anyway, the sort of point that we're making here we're not really making a point here. Um, is that this library, hideous as it is, will give us some nice astronomical functions uh, for the replet we were looking at previously. Uh, and then we can actually start answering some potentially interesting questions uh, and maybe even sort of marry this back into the, into the map. Um, I'm just going to say words now. Back into the map project where we want to show where the sun and moon are at a given time. All right, so let's go ahead and get this sucker into the replet. No, let's first get to the replet. Okay. No one has joined the stream today, so I'm pretty happy about that. I'm very shy. Um, and we called it interpolation because, of course, we were interpolating the sun and moon's position. Okay, so I think we're going to follow our standard of calling this um, BC Rosetta because it comes out of the comes out of a different uh, language, Mathematica, and then we're going to follow the principle of um, I probably could have just uploaded this, but you know, why do something correctly when you can do it wrong? Copy and paste, and it looks uglier here because we have a uh, fewer fewer line stuff. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and, of course, eliminate the, the tests. Come on. And some of the spacing, because I don't like spacing. Actually, I don't have an opinion on spacing. Just need to fill some banter here. Okay. I'm hoping these will work once we give them the correct uh, inputs. If they don't, uh, that's not good. Okay, so it's really only 11 lines, but that's only because uh, the Rosetta program spits out one-line function definitions. Uh, okay, so um, let's go over here and include this. I think we can include it before anything else because it's not a dependency. Now, it's possible that there's something so wrong with it that this won't even run. So let's find out. Let's confirm that's going to happen. No. It did not happen. Okay. So now what are we going to do? I'm actually asking. I don't know. Um, there's no one in chat except for Lurks, who I don't know what that is. I think it's a bad thing, but it's not something I'm too worried about. So now, and uh, let's give ourselves another 15 minutes here, maybe. Let's go over here and see if we can... Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, this is where I tried to define it, and it was incorrect. Um, I'm pretty sure Rosetta, I do define GMST. If I don't, I'm going to be unhappy with myself. And I'm going to be unhappy with myself. I don't have GMST here. Wow. Okay. That's okay. Before I forget, we're going to go ahead and save this zip, although we haven't really changed it very much. Um... Okay, we can fix this because I think uh, we can go to our little Mathematica thing and um, and get the formula that doesn't have hideous variables in it. Let's go up here. I think this is not going to break um, JavaScript. And this is D, number of days. Um... And of course, the format's a little bit different, but this should be okay. And in fact, I don't think I need the parentheses because this is a, a simple return. Uh, this function, by the way, does not as well. Okay, I've got it up here. This does not is not an object thing. It just sort of does. It's a very simple function. It doesn't take and return objects. Okay, so um, 
let's now see if we can use some of what we have not learned. In other words, some of the functions we were gonna we, we had earlier. And I'm I'm actually kind of hoping that I can um, sort of end this by giving you the sunset for Albuquerque. Oh, we actually need this function. Um, yeah, I think we're fine in terms of what I've commented out. Let's see if it runs. If I've broken it, let's see. No, I have not. Awesome. Good day. Okay. So uh, what we can do here is we can get the uh, sun's declination. Um, or, or, or we can't. It's got to be down here somewhere, right? Um, I might have to change solar lunar to solar. We could get the sun and moon's position, but I don't actually know where the moon is. And I'm too lazy to check, even with Stellarium. Oh, come on. A lot of this stuff, of course, we did before we had the function and helped us write the function. We don't really need it now. Okay. Why do I have X no... Oh, because known is the current time. So let's be a little bit careful as we do this. Um, and we're going to refer this back to be just T. Now, you can get Unix time from JavaScript. I don't know if I've written a function to do it, but it's not that hard. Um, so let's play this like we totally don't know what we're doing. And it's not really playing that, by the way. Um, there should be a function. So let's just say now equals new date. I think that should work. Um, and then we should be able to convert it to, to Unix seconds. And this, by the way, notice that it's, it's going to keep changing as we run it. T is not defined. Well, you know what? You are correct. We'll fix that. Array is not defined. Where the hell am I using that? Line 117. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> because I use t equals zero, it actually comes in, um, t equals zero is the beginning of 1970 for Unix time. And the approximations I'm using, as I said, were for 2015 to 2025. So let's be actually a little bit nice and fix this. Um, let's see. Blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah, let's okay, so... This is, we should really be throwing an error here, uh, but we're not going to. We're just going to return too early, and I'm going to make a note to make this a little bit better. Improve this error handling. And the other case will be if, we, if it's too high, but that's harder to check for. So let's see if this unbreaks it. It does. And right now it is almost 2,200 hours, um, in case you just wanted to know that. Okay, now let's be really good here. Now dot, get date, get date, get milliseconds, which might be what we need. Get time, get seconds. One of these actually converts it to um, converts it to the number of seconds since um, since nineteen se so, since something. I don't know what that actually is, by the way, but. Um, Um, I wonder if... No, I don't think this is going to be quite nice enough. Wow. Whoa! That is cool. Well, okay. It was cool for a second. Um, I was hoping we'd get more information without even having to leave Replit. And we might be able to, but we have to be really careful how we do our parentheses. Get millisecond. Get the milliseconds of the date. That's not what we want. This is actually really, really nice. Get the time value in milliseconds. 
That's different from get milliseconds, isn't it? That was a rhetorical question. Let's, use, let's see what that does. I think that is, might actually give us the... This might give us a number of milliseconds since uh, something. Something, of course, being uh, some epoch that they've defined. Beautiful! And I think that's actually the current Unix time times a thousand, because it is, again, millisecond. So... Now we can actually assign t correctly as being now get time divided by a thousand. Uh, now I could round off because uh, Unix programs don't like fractional seconds, at least the ones I use don't. Uh, but this actually doesn't care. So um, let's run this real quick. This is going to fail so badly, I'm going to feel really. Um, really bad about it. Does that make sense? I'm going to go ahead and get rid of some of our console logs here because we no longer need them. And when you no longer need someone, you should let them go and kill them. Uh, so, die console logs. Good strategy with children also, and if you listen to me for parental advice, you're crazy man. Um, let's see if this does what I don't want it to do. Good, it's nothing. Um, let's go hog wild. And uh, I, I mean, I happen to know the sun's declination. We're getting close to the winter solstice. So it's going to be about minus 23 degrees. We actually looked at it yesterday. It's going to be very similar to that. Red ascension, uh, the winter solstice would be 18 hours. So we're probably looking about uh, 17 hours would be um, half a month. But, you know, 17 hours is what I'm thinking. So now, of course, these numbers are coming back as radians, which is exactly what we want. Um, and I think just I'm going to be really careful here because they're not coming back. These are objects. It's the Y value that we want. That's the actual radians. So that's th that's the radians. And we can divide it by degree to get the number of degrees, which is, of course, what we're more familiar with. And here, we're going to take RAY, divide it by <sighs> degree, and then divide it by 15 to get hours. I think that is correct. And of course, as I keep forgetting, <laughs> these are all, the numbers are being returned very, very in, in micro radians. Isn't that a lovely thing? It's not. We, we will need to fix that. Okay. Did I still, I still left in Lunar, didn't I? Uh, so that might be where the moon is, I don't know. I haven't seen it recently, but I don't never go out. So let's do this. That's interesting that that kind of helped. Um, RA is... That is... No, it might be actually. Hang on. Because <laughs> we have to mod this number by 2 pi. And again, this is stuff we're going to fix, obviously. This is not... Um, This is not going to be acceptable for the final product. But for now, we're being weird. Okay, 16 hours seems a little bit early, but this, this seems about correct. So now can we use one of our nice uh, functions that we defined to figure out how long the sun, roughly speaking, is up. Now, the sun does not have a constant declination during the day. It does move around a little bit. So, but it's actually pretty close for today. And how close is it, Bob? Okay. Um... Let's actually answer that question. So what we can do here, let's compute the exact same thing, but one day ago. But you know, so how much has it moved in a day? Well, a day is 86,400 seconds. So we just change this value, to this minus 6400. And then of course we need to console log that separately. I don't know what this is going to do, by the way. Uh, the change in right ascension for the sun is almost exactly four minutes or one fifteenth of a uh, you know one fifteenth of an hour, uh, because that's how the sun completes uh, how we complete an orbit around the sun every year. Okay, so you'll notice there is a little bit of a difference here. Uh, here, sixteen point five eight to point five eight. That's going to be a point oh eight hours uh, times sixty minutes is I think close to what I said. 
Okay, so now we have the, this information that looks pretty good to us. Um, what can we do with it? I, and I really don't know. Let's see. Um, Declad alt. Declad alt to as. Um, I want to use something that's kind of cool here, but I don't know if we have that. Re declat on. Okay, why don't we figure out how long the sun stays up at various altitudes using this little function here. And I'm pretty sure it's going to return time in radians, so we, we do have to convert from from radians to uh, uh, to hours with something we can actually use. Okay. So the declination is going to be the declination of the sun, which we've defined. Our latitude, we're going to say, is my latitude, which is this. And I have defined degree as a constant here, so I can do that. Um, and we want to know how long the sun, and this is actually going to be interesting, is about zero degrees first. And that should be it for my parameters. And let's console log that. And this is going to be in radian, so let's be even really clever here. And um, convert radians to degrees is divide by degree, uh, and then divide by 15 to get hours. And in this case, by the way, uh, we because we're looking at a time interval, we don't have to mod out by 2 pi. Um, well, uh, yes, and it would be nice if I actually, the, you know, the name matched the uh, the name of the file fucking file okay not a number so that's pretty nice Let's see what went wrong here uh, deck which we assigned to be oh no I'm sorry deck dot y I thought we'd fix that but maybe not still not a number so deck lat alt yeah, that should have worked, actually. Well, let's change this number to be like minus 0 0.1 or something. Just to see if the zero is buggy, which it shouldn't, by the way. Yeah. So, declination... Now, I don't know why it's saying string any. That kind of bugs me. Let's take a look at this here. Um... I might not have thought about this, but I don't know if this is for some reason going to treat dec any, lat any, alt any. So it should be treating those numbers uh, as numbers. And it apparently does not want to be doing that. Um, I might be just reading this wrong. Let's see. Deck string or... Mm, no, okay, that should be fine. Am I missing a... Um, I can't be missing that. Um, okay, so I think uh, at this point, unless there are questions, which would require there be people, and there aren't, um, let's see, we've been going for about an hour and 18 minutes, I think that's that's good. Uh, let's go ahead and call this the stream, and next time we're going <sighs> to, we're going to do that funny breathing sound. Um, I might look at this formula here to see what's going wrong. I mean, this here is the secant, because again, um, Mathematica has a secant function, but uh, JavaScript doesn't. Um, it's actually not that hard, by the way, the functions are not that hard to, to create manually. Uh, I was hoping to leverage uh, Mathematica, and apparently I cannot. Alright, thank you for watching the stream, and goodbye for now.